had a really full, full day, lots of great content. Hope you had a chance to meet some new friends and connect with old friends. And uh, I just want to end the day by telling you some stories about airplanes because it's kind of what I like to do. Um, I've been an aviation geek for literally as long as I can remember. It probably started when I was eight or nine years old. My parents took me to an air show at Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas. And the Air Force Thunderbirds, the F-16 demonstration team, was the featured attraction of the day. And if you've ever seen them with Blue Angels, you know how astounding they are. They fly these amazing high-performance aircraft in very close proximity to each other and manage to not run into each other, which is a pretty amazing thing. And I was blown away by it, but as blown away as I was by that, the thing that really stuck with my young imagination was standing nose-to-nose -nose with this amazing machine, the SR-71 Blackbird. And you just look at this plane and tell how fast it wants to go. It's got these razor-sharp leading edges, these curves. The engine nacelles are almost as big as the fuselage. You can't quite tell it in this picture. But standing nose-to-nose -nose with this airplane started a lifelong obsession with planes for me. I, this was pre-internet, so I went back to my elementary school and had the school librarian pull every book she could find that mentioned the SR-71 for me and spent two or three months reading about this plane and others like it. Years later, my career has taken a decidedly non-aviation turn. I am now VP of Engineering at a company called Move Health. And we're working on software that's going to change how major procedures like knee and hip replacements are paid for in this country. But I'm still fascinated by the world of airplanes and everything having to do with aviation. And Every once in a while, I run across an aviation story that lends some wisdom to how I practice my craft, how I build my teams. And this story today of a series of planes built by an even more amazing group of engineers is one of those stories. So if you see an SR-71 in the museum, if you look at the tail sometime, sometimes you'll see this logo. Not always, but sometimes. And the reason that that cute little skunk is on the tail of the SR-71 is that this plane was designed and built by Lockheed Martin's Advanced Projects Division, better known as Stuntworks. Now companies love throwing the term Stuntworks around. Anytime you have a project where you need rapid innovation or you need to keep something secret from the CEO, you set up Stuntworks. Lockheed Martin's was the original. This is where that term comes from. And today I want to tell you about three of their most iconic planes and the stories of how they were built. To do that, I've got to start by telling you about this man, Clarence Kelly Johnson. Because without Kelly Johnson, there would not be a stunt works. Now, Kelly graduated from the University of Michigan in 1932 with an aeronautical engineering degree. He applied for work at Lockheed. This is when Lockheed was about a 10 person company. And they didn't hire him because he didn't have enough experience. So he went back to the University of Michigan, got his master's degree in aeronautical engineering. And while he was there, he happened to be fortunate enough to work on this plane, the Lockheed Electra. Now, at this point, the University of Michigan was one of the few places in the country that had wind tunnels and were actively testing aircraft in their wind tunnels. And he was fortunate enough that his professor, knowing that he wanted to work at Lockheed, assigned him to work on this project, testing this plane in the wind tunnel. Well, that was the connection Kelly needed. And after graduating with his master's in aeronautical engineering, he got a job at Lockheed not as an aeronautical engineer, but as a tool designer, making 83 bucks a month. Not what he wanted to be doing, but it was his way to get in the door. Well, as he was testing this plane, as he was working on his graduate degree, he and his professor had different opinions about it. His professor thought it was perfectly stable and ready for production. He disagreed. He thought that it was particularly unstable in pitch. And once he started working at Lockheed, found an opportune time to talk to Hall Hibbert, the chief engineer of Lockheed at the time, about this. Hall actually considered firing him on the spot for insubordination, because who was this young whippersnapper to tell him that this plane that they had banked their company on was unstable? But he went and started looking at the wind tunnel results, and the thing that Hall Hibbert quickly realized is that Kelly Johnson was right. The plane was unstable in pitch. And so, for his comeuppance, he sent Kelly Johnson to go retrieve the wind tunnel model of this plane, shove it in the back of the station wagon, and drive it to the University of Michigan. 73 iterations in the wind tunnel later, this is what he came up with. I can swipe back and forth, and you'll notice the difference in the tail of the planes. That was what it took to cure the, the instability of this plane. And this, this plane, the Lockheed Electra, went on to be a great success in the early days of commercial aviation in this country. 
And because of his work on this plane, Kelly Johnson got his promotion from tool designer to aer aeronautical engineer. He designed a series of planes uh, leading up to World War II, the most famous of which you've probably heard of, Milwaukee P-38 Lightning. If you've ever been to a World War II museum, you've almost certainly seen this plane. It's one of the most famous planes of World War II, and it absolutely dominated the skies over Europe early in the war. Pilots loved to fly. It was great at dogfighting, very maneuverable, had plenty of speed. And it was in, it was in the, the lead position until the Germans started flying this plane. The Messerschmitt ME-262. Now, this plane has the distinction of being the first jet aircraft ever deployed in combat. And it was way faster than anything that the Allies had. Uh, the Germans had started investing in jet propulsion way earlier than anybody else in the world, and were much further in the deployment of that technology, so they were able to get this plane in combat. Well, lucky for the Americans, the British had been working on a jet engine of their own. But because the UK is smaller, it doesn't have the production capability of the US, the British reached out and asked if the Americans would like to license the Havilland H-1B Goblin engine, one of the first jet engines that the Allies produced. The Air Force approached Lockheed about this project and asked them to build a one-off prototype of a plane around this engine. Lockheed at the time was busy doing this. This is the P-38 assembly line in the middle of World War II. This is what all of their facilities look like. They were trying to build these planes faster than the Germans could shoot it down. And they were making plenty of money doing it. So there wasn't much motivation in Lockheed Corker to take on this one-off prototype, especially when the Air Force asked for it to be done in 180 days. They viewed it as tremendously risky. But both Hall Pippard and Kelly Johnson had been wanting to get into jet propulsion. They both believed that it was the future of aviation. Beyond that, Kelly Johnson had been budding the brass at Lockheed for a long time to let him set up an experimental aircraft division where he could put the designers and the fabricators and the mechanics all under one roof to work closely together outside of the regular bureaucracy of the Lockheed organization. And this was an opportune time for them to do that. So Paul Hibbert convinced the brass at Lockheed to let him do that. And he gave this project to produce one plane in 180 days to Kelly Johnson. The first thing Kelly had to figure out, though, was where to work. Because, like I said, all of their factories looked like this in the middle of World War II. So, he did what any of us would have done. He ran a circus tent. He had desks installed, he had phones installed, he even had them air conditioned. Everything you need to make it an office, he did that. And he set it up next to a factory on Lockheed, on Lockheed grounds. And the, the factory that he set it up next to was a plastics production facility, and apparently it smelled Heroin. So the SP-80, as this plane had been designated, the project was a secret. And they especially didn't want any of the engineers revealing what they were working on when they answered the phone. So Kelly Johnson gave out strict instructions to his people not to answer the phone anything related to XP-80 or jet aircraft. Well, Irv Culver, a structural engineer on the project, who was known as a bit of a cut-up, took to answering the phone, it's got works, Irv here. And it wasn't long before the Skunk Works moniker started catching on with other engineers at Skunk Works. And the name stuck. So if you've ever called a division of your company Skunk Works, it's because Kelly Johnson set up a circus tent next to a smelly plastics factory. So the contract for the SPA was signed on June 24, 1943. And this started the 180-day clock. The only concrete information they had about this plane that they were building was the dimensions of the engine. They didn't even have the engine at this point. They were still waiting on it to be shipped over from the UK. So they built a model of the engine and designed the plane around that. Normally, when they started on a plane, they would build a mock-up out of wood so that they could test part fitment and make sure they built all parts in a way that it could be repeated. Well, they were just building one of these. They didn't need to do that. So Kelly Johnson decreed that this plane that they were building would be the mock-up itself, and the engineers were free to design parts to fit on the spot and just stick on this plane. He also reduced the formality of the drawing approval process. So normally in Lockheed, they had a very strict process that they followed for making drawings and approving drawings. They had strict style guides that they followed. Kelly decided to do away with all that. They had 180 days to put together a plane. He was going to have to cut some corners to get it done. So he told his engineers that as long as your drawings convey the meaning of what needs to be built, I don't care what they look like. Just make sure the person you're giving them to can understand. And that was enough. That's how they got this plane built. It worked. 
So by November 13th, they were done. 143 days after they started. They had a complete aircraft. They took it apart, shipped it up to Muroc Air Force Base in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Why did they do that? Well, they didn't know. nobody had ever built a jet aircraft in the United States to this point. They weren't exactly sure what was going to happen when they tried to take off. They wanted to make sure there was plenty of room in case things went sideways. Lucky for them, they didn't. Shortly after New Year's Day, the XP-80 took flight for the first time, and it flew like a dream. It would actually go on to be the first American-built plane to fly over 500 miles an hour in level flight. And the production version of it, the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star, would go on to be the, act, the first jet ever deployed by the Air Force in combat. Not only that, but it would fly well into the 80s, so this plane that's going to work slack together in 143 days would go on to be in service for over 40 years. Pretty good design. Well, about this time, World War II was wrapping up, and it was unclear if Stump Works was going to have anything else to work on. There was, the U.S. was in tremendous debt from the war. There was very little desire to build a new plane, and there was no, no threat to be countered. So Kelly's band of misfits disbanded and went back to their places around the Lockheed factory, stopped building planes, and weren't sure they were going to get to do it again. That didn't last for long. This picture is of Winston Churchill, FDR, and Joseph Stalin. At the Alta Conference. The Alta Conference was one of the three conferences that the three Allied powers had after World War II to decide how the European continent was going to be split up and governed. It was actually at Yalta that the decision was made to split Germany and to split Berlin. These three superpowers had united against the Axis powers during World War II, but they had such different ambitions for the European continent that as soon as the war was over, they started getting a little cross with each other. And the U.S. and the Soviet Union began spending on military, um, military facilities and military equipment at a rapid pace, trying to keep pace with each other. And we had entered the Cold War. Well, it wasn't just military spending that increased. Espionage activity went way up as well. Around this time, something around 55% of the American population thought that they were more likely to die in thermonuclear war than old age. And they weren't too far off the mark. The Russians and the U.S. had both built tremendous nuclear arsenals under the theory of mutually assured destruction, that if we just build enough bombs, we'll both be too scared to ever drop them, and that will keep this tension contained. In order for that to happen, each side desperately needed to know what the other was up to. The Americans were interested among everything else in this place, Pustin Yar. Pustin Yar is Russia's primary missile development facility, something akin to Area 51 in the US. And it was very heavily defended. The Air Force considered an overflight of Pustin Yar, but decided it was too dangerous because of how heavily it was defended. After a lot of lobbying, though, the CIA was able to get the Air Force to attempt an overflight in this plane, the Martin B 57 Canberra, which is actually a bomber. So they got in this plane, they took everything out of it they possibly could, tried to make it as light as they could, put a camera in it, and flew it at about 50,000 feet, which the normal operating temp altitude for this plane is somewhere in the, the high 30,000, low 40,000 feet. So they got an extra 10,000 feet, but it limped back to base, having taken anti-aircraft fire in 12 different spots. Somehow made it back, but they decided they would never do that again. So they needed a different answer. Intelligence of the day indicated that Russian radar was blind over about 65,000 feet. And so the CIA, knowing this, decided what they needed was a plane that could fly at 70,000 feet. If they could just do that, the Russians would never see it coming. So they asked for bids. But given that they had no means of reconnaissance until they got this plane, they needed this plane fast as well. Well, the Scumworks crew proposed a refactoring of an existing design, the F-104 Starfighter. This is a plane that Stumpworks had built early in the Cold War. It was the first American plane capable of going Mach 2. And what they thought that they could do with this plane, because it was, a, it was a pretty light plane already, they decided that they could change the engine out, lengthen the wings, and reduce weight, and come up with something that would fly at 70,000 feet. Because their proposal was based on an existing plane, and along with the body of work that they produced in the P-80 and the F-104, how quickly they had been able to build both of those planes and get them into production, their proposal went out. The 
plane they were building, of course, was the U-2. So the team started working on the U-2 in November of 1954. The project was so secret that the kickoff payment for the project actually went to Kelly Johnson's house in the form of a $1.1 million check addressed to CNJ Engineering. CJ, of course, being Clarence Johnson's initials. They took the F-104 fuselage and made it thinner. They made it out of wafer-thin aluminum. So thin, in fact, that when a worker accidentally bumped into one of these things with the toolbox, it left a four-inch dent in the side of the plane. Normally, if you bumped into a plane with a toolbox, I mean, you might scuff the paint, but you certainly wouldn't leave one to leave a four-inch dent in it. People at Skunkworks were wondering if this plane was even going to be strong enough to fly. Eight months later, though, right on schedule, they loaded the crate plane up into the belly of a C-124 cargo plane, and they flew it out to a purpose-built airfield in the middle of the Nevada desert, right in the middle of a bunch of dried-out lake beds. Again, they weren't really sure how this plane was going to behave, and they picked an area with dried-out lake beds because there's lots of potential runways out there. If something went sideways, there's lots of places you can land. If I show the two planes together, I'll back up so you can see it. If I show the two planes together, you can pretty clearly see the family lineage, especially from the wing forward. And this picture, taken by Kelly Johnson himself, is of the actual first flight of the U-2 on August 4th, just a hair over, the eight, over eight months from when the first metal of the plane was cut. A month after this first flight, test pilots were breaking altitude records almost daily over the Nevada desert. By the end of testing, the plane had been up to 74,500 feet, the highest any plane had ever flown. And it had flown over 5,000 miles for 10 hours on a single tank of gas. So it met the operational requirements to fly over Russia. Despite the ability to fly three miles higher than any other plane ever built, the U-2 is really a remarkably simple plane. Weight was everything in this plane. Every pound cost the plane approximately one foot of altitude. This is a picture of the inside structure of the wing. This wing weighed about four pounds per square foot. Most aircraft wings of this day weigh, weigh about 12 pounds per square foot. So it's about a third as heavy as a normal aircraft wing. Looks kind of like a sheet metal on it on the inside. Now the problem with this wing, like I alluded to earlier, is it doesn't have a lot of rigidity. It's so light that one of the constant complaints from pilots is that when they would hit turbulence, the wings would flap like a seagull. And they were afraid they were going to break off. They never did. It didn't affect mission viability at all. Another interesting thing about the U-2 is it was designed with tandem bicycle-style landing gear. This is pretty common on gliders, but not on jet aircraft. The combined weight of this landing gear mechanism of the front and back wheel is 200 pounds. It's the lightest landing gear that's ever been deployed on a jet aircraft. And it's easier for me just to show you how this works. I've got a video of it to land. So you can see the plane coming in over us. We're actually in a chase car in this video. Um, because the pilot's in a bulky pressure suit, they actually can't see the ground when they're coming in for landing. So they have a chase car behind them that's calling out altitudes. Two feet, one feet, six inches. They finally get on the ground. And you can see the pilot is literally flying the plane down the runway, balancing it on the two wheels. So he goes down the runway, finally bleeds off enough speed, and tips the plane over onto its wing. Then they sent this crew of guys out there to start pulling on the wing and try to put a pogo gear under the other side. So they've got these removable landing gear that go under both wings, and that's once they get stopped on the runway, they, they literally go out and four or five guys hang on one side of the plane, and one guy puts this pogo gear in on the other side. It actually uses the same pogo gear to take off. So when it takes, you can see it right there, taxing with the pogo gear in place. When it takes off, they just fall away as it takes off, and then somebody goes out and picks them up off the runway. Such a freaking hack. But it saved them a lot of weight. Every part of the U-2 served only one purpose, to get this payload up to 70,000 feet and fly over Russia with it. This payload is, this one, this particular model is in the Air and Space Museum in Washington. It's a 30, camera with a 36 inch focal length lens. At the point it was developed, it was the highest resolution camera that had ever been built. I mean, 
modern spy satellites obviously can do much better than this, but in the 1950s, to be able to resolve an object that was two and a half feet across from 70,000 feet, it's a pretty impressive feat. And because that's what they cared about, they hacked the rest. They could have made the wings more rigid so they didn't flap, it wouldn't have cost them too much weight. But they wanted to make them as light as possible because the thing that mattered at the U-2 was the altitude, it was how high it could fly. It's hard to land, so conventional wisdom would have been to put more landing gear in so that you didn't have to balance it going down the runway. It didn't matter. They didn't need extra landing gear. What they built was fine, and it let them get the altitude they needed to get to. And so they started overflights of Russia, gathered a lot of great intelligence data, but there was a problem. It turns out that the intelligence they had was flawed. Russian radar was not blind above 65,000 feet. So almost from the first overflight of Russia, they had MiGs chasing them about 20,000 feet below. Now, the MiGs couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't fly that high. They didn't have any missiles that could shoot that high. But they knew when they were there. There were, there were instances where MiGs actually flew in formation under a U-2 trying to block its view. Because of this, they knew it was just a matter of time before the Russians figured out how to shoot it down. So they thought that they had probably 18 months to two years of operational liability for the U-2 before the Russians got this figured out, and it would be too risky to fly the U-2 over Russia anymore. They needed a different answer. So the CIA and the Air Force put out a bid and asked for bids on a replacement for the U-2 almost immediately after it went into operation. In response, Stumpwork started on the Archangel series of design studies. This is an early one here. By the time it got to the 11th revision, it'll start looking a little bit more familiar to you. You probably think I'm about to tell you about the SR-71. I'm not. I'm about to tell you about the A-12, the predecessor of the SR-71. Now, the technological leap that this plane represents is almost impossible to comprehend. It's designed to fly five miles higher than the U-2 at 9,000 feet. And it's designed to fly four times faster at model 3.25. Now the fastest plane that has been built to this day is still the F-104 Starfighter. And it can dash at Mach 2. But the SR-71 is designed to cruise at Mach 3.25 for hours at a time. Performing at those extremes meant almost everything the team knew about traditional airplane design just didn't apply. And the CIA in their generosity, gave Stumpworks 22 months to figure it out. So normally, you would build a plane that needed to go very high on aluminum. You would want a lightweight material so that you didn't have a lot of weight to carry up to altitude. The only problem with that is how this aluminum loses its structural integrity at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, flying at Mach 3.25, their early calculations indicated that this plane would be about 800 degrees Fahrenheit at the nose and 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit on the engine counts. So if you tried to fly a plane made out of aluminum at that speed, it would literally just fold up on itself. It would crush like an aluminum can. They considered stainless steel, which would have stood up to the temperatures just fine. Stainless is heavy. And so if they built it out of stainless steel, they wouldn't have been able to get the altitude they needed out of this plane. So Henry Combs, the primary structural engineer on the project, suggested they build it out of titanium instead. The problem is, nobody knew how to build anything this big out of titanium. They built the engine exhaust on the F-104 out of titanium, and it was a real pain in the butt. They had a hard time doing it because titanium was phenomenally hard to machine. But, it's half as heavy as stainless steel, and it would have no problem standing up to the temperatures or the pressures that the plane was expected to experience. So Kelly Johnson said, any material that can cut our gross weight by half is damn tempting, even if it'll drive us nuts in the process. And he was absolutely right about it driving me nuts in the process. So they ordered a test batch of titanium to see if this is something that was even feasible for them to do. And when it showed up, they realized they had no idea how to extrude it, how to weld it, how to rim it, or even how to drill it. The drill bits they normally used on, on the aluminum would just shatter when they tried to drill titanium. On top of that, the only U.S. supplier of titanium at this point was producing batches of wildly varying quality 
and didn't have the capability to produce titanium in the quantity that they needed to build the planes that they were expecting to build. So they asked for help. They, they called the CIA and said, we want to build this thing out of titanium. We need to help us figure out where we can get some. And so eventually, through a series of dummy companies and third parties, the CIA set a supply chain up from the leading exporter of titanium of the day, the Soviet Union. <laughs> So literally, the metal to build the A-12 came from the very country it was being built to spy upon. An extreme operating environment of this plane required adaptation everywhere in the plane. Their early calculations also indicated that this plane, when operating at altitude and temperature, would actually stretch by about two or three inches from its ground length, just from the air heating, the, the friction of the air heating. So all of the systems on the plane had to cope with that, that friction and that stretching. They built the control cables on the plane out of Elgiloy. Now, Elgiloy is a, a pretty expensive metal that's used to build high-end watch springs because you can stretch it out several times and it never loses its tensile strength. They built the engine nozzles out of this obscure nickel alloy called Hastelloy X because Hastelloy X can withstand the 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit that the afterburners produced when they ran for an hour or two at a stretch. Off-the-shelf electronics wouldn't function because of the extreme heat. Neither would oils, hydraulic fluids, greases, you name it. They had to come up with new answers for all of this stuff. Even fuel. They developed a custom fuel for this plane so that it wouldn't be volatile at the, at, when it was up to temperature at altitude. The only problem with the fuel they developed is it had such a low flash point that you couldn't light the stuff. So to get it lighted, you had to inject the engine with triumphal boring. Triumphal boring. boring is really nasty stuff that when you expose it to the atmosphere, it spontaneously combusts with this bright green flash. That's literally the only way they can get this fuel lit. One of the biggest challenges, though, was propulsion. No plane had ever been in Mach 3.25, at least no air-breathing plane. They'd sent Mach 3 planes this fast. So they had to figure out how to build an air-breathing engine that could go over Mach 3. And Kelly Johnson, but 32-year-old Ben Rich in charge of this process. Ben was a thermodynamics engineer that had participated in building propulsion on the F-104, so we already knew how they had built that plane and how they had gotten it to Mach 2. So, you know, Mach 2, Mach 3.25, not that big a leap. Never been done before. So they took an off-the-shelf J-58 turbofan from Pratt & Whitney. Now, this engine had been built for a fighter jet, and the project had subsequently been canceled. So Pratt & Whitney was really looking for a home for this engine. They wanted somebody to pay for all the research they had done on it. The problem was, it required extensive modifications to even keep running at 70,000 feet, because they're at 90,000 feet, so there's just no oxygen up there. The atmosphere is so thin. Their answer to that are what you see right here, the inlet cones. Now these inlet cones, when this plane gets up to speed, when it's going Mach 3, actually move 26 inches back into the engine. To understand why, you have to understand how jet engines work. A jet engine, the opening on the front is scooping as much air as possible in. And over a series of compressors, compressing that out into a small stream, and that's how it builds its speed. It's kind of like when you take a water hose and you put your finger over the end of it and the water starts spraying. Same theory, just on a much grander scale. So in order to get this air-breathing engine to work at 90,000 feet, they needed something else to produce compression besides just the compressor. That's where these inlet cones come into place. At cruise speed, the amount of compression these inlet cones, the amount of compression these inlet cones produce is responsible for 70% of the overall engine thrust. Just the inlet cones. The afterburners another 25%. The turbine itself is only producing 5% of the engine's thrust at altitude. And there's so much, these, these inlet cones produce so much compression that air coming in is negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit on the, on the leading edge. By the time it passes the cone and gets to the combustion stage of the engine, it's at 800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how much compression these cones are producing. But even more interesting to me is what they chose not to solve in the SR-71. There was no fuel system sealant that was affected with the entire temperature range that the plane was expected to operate with. So the plane would actually just sit on the tarmac dripping fuel. You can 
You see the puddle under this plane. That's not water. They shouldn't care. It didn't matter that the plane sat on the tarmac dripping fuel because it just they just didn't keep it fueled up on the ground. That's why they solved that problem. Took it off, back to supersonic speed, the fuel system sealed, no big deal. Another problem they chose not to solve is how to start the engines. Well, I told you about the triumphal boring that you have to inject to get the engines to light. You also have to get the turbines turning 4,500 RPM, and these were not small turbines. So they thought about putting a starter engine on the plane. And the problem is to get those giant turbines turning 4,500 RPM, they would have to put a giant starter motor on there, and it would have cost them a ton of altitude. So instead of doing that, they solved it with this, the AG330 start cart. Now, when the ground crews is the Buick. And the reason they called it the Buick is because it quite literally is two Buick V8 Wildcat engines coupled together. They physically couple that to the starter shaft of the engine, crank it to full throttle, and then inject the triathlon boring and light off the engine. It's a self sustaining combustion at that point. The ground crew said that the hangar sounded like a stock car race when they started this plane up. But you know what? It didn't cost them any altitude. It's a, it's a pretty elegant hack. There are only two things that mattered in building the A12. It needed to go very fast, and it needed to do so very high. Five miles higher and four times faster than the U2. So on April 30th, 1962, a full year and 100% over budget, Stuntworks gave the CIA what they wanted. This is a picture of the A12's first flight. It dripped fuel. You couldn't start the engines without crazy chemicals and a couple of V8 race car engines, but it didn't matter. They spent their time and money on the things that didn't matter, the titanium construction, the propulsion, and they hacked the rest. This plane went Mach 3.25 at 90,000 feet and overflew every hostile territory in the world. After building 15 A-12s for the CIA, the Air Force took over the program. And they requested that Skunkworks modify the plane to be a twin-seater and add about 50% more cargo capacity so they could have more sensors up there at altitude. That plane is the A-12's far more famous younger brother, the SR-71. It flew for 30 years and has the distinction of being the only U.S. combat aircraft to have never been shot down, despite 3,500 sorties over very hostile territory and hundreds of missiles launched at it. It holds about every speed and altitude record there is. For altitude, it set a record of 85,069 feet. Now, this is the official record set over a defined course. This plane almost certainly went higher than 85,000 feet. Speed, 2,193.2 miles an hour, just a shade over Mach 3.3. Now, in his book, Sled Driver, Brian Schul, uh, a U-2, an SR-71 pilot, tells a story of evading missiles over Libya. And after he hit, dodged the missiles, his uh, reconnaissance systems officer in the back seat had to remind him to back the speed off of the plane. And when he looked down, he realized he was going just a touch over Mach 3.5. So we know it would go faster than Mach 3.3, but this is the official record. So what does that actually mean? Well, the muzzle velocity of a 22 caliber rifle bullet is 2,046 miles an hour. And the SR-71 goes 2,193 miles an hour. So the SR-71 at cruise speed can make the claim that it is literally faster than a speeding bullet. How fast can it get places? Well, New York to London, the SR-71 could fly in one hour and 55 minutes. The Concord, on a good day, with a strong tailwind, could do it in two hours and 52 minutes. Los Angeles to Washington, across the United States, the SR-71 could do that in one hour and four minutes. And I love this next one. It's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. In the course of setting that Los Angeles to Washington record, they also tracked it from St. Louis to Cincinnati. The SR-71 can do that in 8 minutes and 32 seconds. If you do that in your car, it's going to take you about 5 hours and 16 minutes. And it'll probably hold these records forever with the advent of unmanned drones and spy satellites. We don't really have any need for a plane that goes this fast. So we're probably never going to build another one. The SR-71 was Kelly Johnson's crowning achievement. In 1975, he had Lockheed's mandatory retirement age of 65, and he passed the reins on to this man, his protege, 
bent wrench. The same bent wrench that at 32 years of age had designed the SR7 months propulsion system. A bent took over stunt works at its tumultuous time. This was post Vietnam. U.S. appetite for military spending was very, very low. There were no new planes being built. And Lockheed had just attempted to re enter the commercial aviation market with this plane, the L 1011 TriStar. And it was a horrible failure. Lockheed lost somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion on this plane. These were $1975, so a ton of money. Ben Rich, after he took over, knew he had to find some significant new work and get it sold to the military pretty quick, or he was going to have to start letting his best engineers go because they were also his most expensive. Meanwhile, the Cold War continued. Nina Brezhnev would be in power in Russia for another eight years. The Soviet Union had invested 300 billion rubles in developing surface to air missiles like this SA 5 that were far more advanced than any attack capability that the US had. We literally couldn't pierce their missile defense. So, in order to maintain the mutually assured destruction that had kept us from bombing each other for all of those years, the US needed to develop something that could get past these missiles. But ideas were in pretty short supply. Until Dennis Overholzer, a 36 year old math and radar expert on the Stunt Work staff, came across this paper The Method of Edge Waves and the Physical Theory of Diffraction. Sounds like an enthralling read, right? Well, it was so enthralling that it actually took the Air Force 10 years to get it translated from when it had been publicly published in Russia. So, this paper had been written by Peter Ophemsev, the chief scientist at the Moscow Institute of Radio Engineering. And it wasn't until Overholzer read this full paper and went all the way through it that he found a shocking revelation in the back. There was a formula in the back that he reasoned he could extrapolate to calculate the radar cross section of the edge and surface of a wing and be able to come up with an accurate reading. Well, that was important because in those days, accurately determining the radar cross section of a plane was only possible on a radar range. You would mount a plane on a pole upside down for some reason and shoot radar at it to see what came back. So if you wanted to develop stealth technology, the only way that you could do it is to iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate. Folks like Overholzer who do the science could make a reasonable inference about what a given change to a plane might do to its, uh, its visibility on radar. But it was not empirical by any, any means. Stealth had long been batted around as a possibility, but it had always been written off as too expensive and too difficult to do effectively. But Overholzer was convinced he had an answer up from such paper. So he convinced Kelly Johnson, to, or he convinced Ben Rich to let him spend some time building software to try to do just that. So Overholzer spent a few weeks hard at work on software to take advantage of the formulas, walked into Ben Rich's office and handed him a sketch of this, which quickly became known around Skunk Works as the hopeless diamond because they didn't think there was any hope of ever getting this thing to fly. Nonetheless, when Rich trusted Dennis Overholzer, and they built up uh, a mock-up and took it out to a radar range in Palmdale, California to see how well it performed on radar, to see if the math actually held up. The radar technician asked Ben Rich, are you sure that they've got the model on the pole? Can you stick your head out the window and look? And so Ben does this, and about the time he sticks his head out the window, a crow lands on the plane. And the radar operator goes, never mind, I got it. Ben didn't have the heart to tell him that he was zapping a crow, not the airplane. And it was at this point that they knew that they were onto something big. Well, about this time, DARPA decided to hold a design competition for stealth on aircraft. Lockheed and Northrop won the first phase and were each given $1.5 million to refine their designs and to build 38 foot models to be tested at the Air Force's most sensitive radar range in White Sands, New Mexico. And that's what you see in this picture is Lockheed's 38 foot model. Again, more radar range problems, though. The plane design was so good that the only thing they were seeing on the radar tests was the pole. Now, up until this point, the Air Force thought that this pole was invisible. They'd never seen it on radar before. But this plane was refre reflecting so little in the way of radio information that they clearly saw the pole on the radar. So in order to get an accurate reading on the plane, the Overholster went to work and built them a better pole, too. You can see that pole there. The pole itself cost around $500,000, but it was no longer visible on the radar. And they came up with a really interesting way of determining the cross-section of 
radar reflectivity for these planes. They knew that they could calculate the expected reflectivity of a sphere. So they took steel ball bearings and started gluing them on the front of the plane. They started with, they started with a three inch, which is a little bit bigger than this. This is a two inch ball bearing. And they went smaller and smaller and smaller. And they knew that as long as they were seeing the expected cross section of that size of sphere on the radar, that they were not seeing the plane. Well, they got all the way down to a one eighth inch ball bearing. See that or not, but it's tiny, it's smaller than a BB. And they can still see the ball bearing. They still weren't seeing the plane, even that small. So Lockheed obviously won the design competition handling. The next step was to build an actual plane and prove that it had, once it had the things that the model didn't have, like engines and intakes and landing gear and a pilot's helmet and a windshield, that it would still be stealthy. The Air Force wanted two prototype planes in 14 months. It's not works agreed. And sure enough, 14 months later, like clockwork, they had a plane ready to fly. Now this plane is literally a bucket of spare parts off the surplus shelf. The flight control computer came out of the F-16, the navigation came out of the B-52, the seat that also came out of the F-16, heads-up display from the F-18, engines from the T-2B, Buckeye trainer, and on and on. Literally the only thing we do about this plane is the exterior skin. The biggest thing they had to solve, obviously, was the aerodynamics. If this looks like it ought to fly to you, it's because you've seen enough pictures of the F-117 over the course of your life to have conditioned your brain that this is a plausible representation of an aircraft. Nobody at this point had ever seen a thing like this that could fly. It was actually unstable in all three axes of flight. It was unstable in pitch, in yaw, and in roll. Now, up until this point, the only plane that had ever been deployed that was unstable in any axis of flight was the F-16, and it was only pitch unstable. But that's one of the reasons they used the flight control computer out of the F-16, because they already had code to deal with the pitch instability and only had to build code for two more axes. Uh, and the way it worked is the computer would constantly calculate what it needed to do to keep this plane stable on flight, and it would sum that with what input the pilot was giving it, and that's what it would send out to the control services. And by doing that, they essentially hacked the laws of physics and made this plane stable. It wasn't so stable at first. Um, its first couple of test flights earned it the nickname the Wobbling Goblin, because it took a while to get the software just right. But they finally got it perfected. True to form, they got it to fly. Because most of the test flights were at night, this is actually the only picture of the uh, half blue in the air that I've ever seen. I think maybe the only one there is. Now they got in there, though, they needed to see if it would live up to its promise of stealthiness. And so they took it up to the Nevada desert and flew it against one of these, the target acquisition radar from a Hawk missile battery, the most sensitive radar equipment that the U.S. had at the time. The plane flew right overhead of this radar dish, never picked it up. The missiles never pointed at the plane, didn't even see it. Less than five years later, the first F-117 detachment was operational out of Tonopah Test Range Airport, which is smack in the middle of Area 51. Now, this would have been sometime in the late 80s, so there's a pretty good chance that any reports of UFOs in that area around 1989 or so were actually this plane. Pilots were actually skeptical to fly it because it looked so strange, but once they got it off the ground, they found it was actually a joy to fly. It was very stable in the air and had great controllability. The American public found out about this plane on the first night of Desert Storm. A total of 22 F-117s flew into Baghdad. The Air Force had actually privately expected about a 30% loss rate on this plane. They expected 30% of these to be shot down because of how well defended Baghdad was. They didn't lose a single plane that night, or for the rest of Desert Storm. Stealth technology lived up to the promise. They couldn't detect it. This whole plane, like I mentioned, is one big hack. They needed to be invisible on radar. And they got very close to that by essentially not caring about aerodynamics at all and hacking their way around the laws of physics and aerodynamics and the inherent instability of the design. The reason this plane is made up of all flat surfaces isn't because you have to do that for it to be stealthy. It's because the technology of the day wasn't sophisticated enough to calculate the radar reflectivity of the curved surface. So you just built it out of flat surfaces. So how'd they do it? All of these amazing planes 
planes, each of which was groundbreaking in some significant way. And several more planes we haven't even talked about. These are just the three headlines. The story ends the same place it began. With Kelly Johnson and his scrappy team of at its peak, 23 designers and 105 fabricators that created the P-80 around a mocked-up engine in 143 days. A plane that was subsequently used for 40 years. Not much about Kelly's philosophy of how Stump Works built planes changed over the years, even when the rains passed in the rich. He was a proponent of prototyping and learning. I tried to find a picture of Hav Blue on the tarmac next to the, next to the F-117 stealth fire, but there aren't any. And I realized it's because they actually managed to crash both of the Hav Blue prototypes before the first F-117 was ever built. It was that much of a throwaway prototype. He liked to iterate. You can see the H-12 on the right here and the SR-71 on the left. The A12 could go a little faster, a little higher than the SR-71, but it turns out it didn't really need to. They revised it to a two-seater with double payload capacity, sacrificing a little bit of altitude with this, but fitting it more closely to the mission, just like we do with software. Once you actually start using the software, you refactor it to fit the ways that your users are actually using it, because sometimes you don't get it right on one. Kelly also had some general rules about how to run organization like his. If you Google Kelly's rules, you can find a list of all of them. Uh, but I'll just share a couple that are particularly relevant to what we do. Uh, the first is to use a small number of good people. Kelly's rules actually say the number of people having any connection with the project must be restricted in an almost vicious manner. Use a small number of good people, 10 to 25 percent compared to a so-called normal project. So the A12, arguably the most sophisticated plane that had ever been built when it was built, at its peak, had 75 design engineers working on it. To give you some contrast, when Boeing built the 777, at its peak, there were 10,000 design engineers working on the 777, and that's with the assistance of computer-aided design. Kelly and his team were still doing drawings by hand. Kelly hired smart people in his organization, and he trusted them to do good work. In the business. Trusted them to bring their expertise to the table. A very simple drawing and drawing release system with great flexibility for making changes must be provided. I mentioned earlier the lightweight drawing system that Kelly put into place for the PA. It became one of those rules. He kept his process to the minimum necessary to give the team the required context. Teams did lightweight drawings, not copious documentation required elsewhere at Lockheed. The drawings only needed to convey their meaning to the people who were going to use them. Get the process as light as practically possible while still giving everybody the information they needed to do their job. So they didn't spend a lot of time feeding the process. They spent a lot of time getting stuff done. Sarah May actually had a great tweet about this. Team pathology is either hanging on to processes suited to a smaller team or early adopting processes suited to a larger team. About 10 years ago, a friend of mine and I started a software consultancy. We did, the first thing we did is probably the first thing you would do if you started a software consultancy. We went out and spent a thousand bucks on a license for Jira, and we spent the better part of two days getting it installed on the VPS so we could track our work. There's two of us. We had one client. We had absolutely no need for that level of process. You can guess we were not an ongoing concern for very long. You need enough process so that everyone has the context they need, but not so much that people turn off their brains and just blindly do what the card says to do. You need people to bring their expertise to the table. You need them to think about what they're being asked to do, and to do it in the right way, the thing that's right for the software, the thing that's right for long-term sustainability. But to do that, you have to give them co the context and the freedom to make those decisions. This is what Kelly Johnson got so right. There's no way he can deliver this level of innovation on his own. The processes he put in place allowed all of his staff to bring their expertise to the table as well. And their collective output is the fabled, the sum is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. He set the right priorities, and that helped his team make the right decisions when they had to make compromises. The most important rule Kelly had was that there shall be but one object to get a good airplane built on time. What made a good airplane? Deliver the value that the customer needed. It hit the key specs and compromised wherever it was necessary to hit those key specs. He was a pragmatist. Every decision was around how to deliver the most value in the shortest amount of time for his customer while bringing the best out of his people. The 
because of the freedom and trust he and his teams, and because of how clearly he laid out goals for his projects, they were able to deliver some of the most amazing airplanes ever built. The U-2 landed on a terrible landing gear. Pilots used to say that it was the easiest plane in the world to fly between 60,000 feet and 6 inches. But the team decided it wasn't worth fixing the landing gear and sacrificing the altitude it would have taken to add even one more bogey in. It was a good compromise. It was the right compromise for that design. The SR-71 is the fastest plane ever built, and it couldn't self-start because starter motors would have added a lot of weight. It sat on the tarmac dripping fuel because it just didn't matter. The team spent all their time figuring out how to build a plane out of titanium so that it could hit Mach 3 at 90,000 feet. They just didn't worry all that much about the rest. The F-117 violates almost every law of aerodynamic design, but they just hacked their way around it so they could have a plane that was invisible on radar. It bucks conventional wisdom in almost every way possible, and it does it because Ben Rich trusted Dennis Overholzer enough to believe that this design could be radar invisible and it was worth the time for them to hack their way around everything else they had to do to build a plane that looked like this. Kelly's and later Ben's teams had unprecedented input into what they were building. They had incredible freedom and trust for their bosses. If you don't have that way to work, you should push for it. You should push to not be just an assembly line worker writing software and then pulling the next car off the stack. You should have input in what your team is building. You should have input into what it's going to take for your team to build an exceptional product. Because you have the expertise to have that input. If you don't have that input, you should either work to change your employer or you should change employers. And if you're a leader, you need to find ways to give your team that freedom. You need to find ways to push decisions as far down into the stack as you possibly can so that everybody on the team is bringing their expertise to bear. Because if you can spread out the decisions, if you can get everybody to contribute, you're going to build something better than you ever could if it's just you or you and a couple of other people making the decisions. You need to make sure that everybody on your team knows the two or three most important things in your project so that they can make the right decisions. They can pick the right places to take on technical debt. Take the time to build and refine a process that works for your team and gives them context and freedom. If you do that, there's no telling.